Okay, so in this episode, we're going to talk a bit about uh, the implications of Bentham's view and some problems uh, with it. And the first implication I want to talk about is to do with the redistribution of wealth. Uh, on the face of it, Bentham's theory calls for a very significant redistribution of wealth, that is, re redistribution of wealth from the rich to the poor. Um, and the reason for this is because of what we now know is the diminishing marginal utility. So um, just think of it, uh, just take a simple example, just on the one hand compare, say, Bill Gates, you know, a multi-billionaire, with uh, a homeless person. And just think, thinking first of the homeless person, just think what a difference giving the homeless person $1,000 would make in that person's life. Um, it would make a huge difference, right? So the, the person would be able to buy food and would be able to, um, uh, uh, you know, afford accommodation and so forth. So the $1,000 would make a very big difference. If we, if we gave the homeless person $1,000, that would make a very big difference in that person's life. Now imagine now that we took a thousand dollars off Bill Gates. How much of a difference would that make in his life? Well, the answer is basically none. He wouldn't even notice. And so, um, as a result, you can see that it, the argument is that if you want to increase utility, then what you should do is take money from Bill Gates and give it to the homeless person, because in this way, utility will be maximised. It will make almost no difference to Bill Gates, and it will make a huge amount of difference to the homeless person. Now, of course, we've just taken two extremes, someone with no resources and someone with a huge amount of resources. But the argument is that this works generally. So <clears throat> um, uh, whenever you've got someone who is wealthier, everything else being equal, taking their wealth off that person and giving it, so, taking some of the wealth of that person and giving it to a person less well off is going to maximize utility because of the diminishing marginal utility. That's the, the utility diminishes at the margin, so that $1,000 means a lot to you if you haven't got any money, but $1,000 doesn't mean much to you if you're a billionaire. Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right, so on the face of it, Bentham's argument, Bentham's position calls for a very uh, significant amount of redistribution in society. Now, Bentham himself, though, actually resisted this. He claimed that this wasn't an implication of his theory. I mean, there are people who criticised him for this. I mean, you may or may not like the idea, but um, but there were, in Bentham's day, lots of people criticised him for, for this. And, and his reply was to say, well, yes, as a matter of principle, my argument requires a, a huge amount of redistribution. But in fact, uh, that's not the case. And the reason for that is that strict, although in principle my argument requires strict equality, it argues for strict equality, if we actually try to achieve strict equality, we would remove the incentive to produce. And again, this is an argument that we hear all the time now. So if we if we achieved strict equality, the problem with that would be, that would achieve, get around the diminishing marginal utility problem, right? But the problem is that it would remove the incentive to produce. So people would just just stop um, uh, trying to uh, produce things because what would be the point? And every time they get ahead, the government would just come along and take away their gain and and spread it out amongst society in general. So you'd remove the the, the incentive for industry, as Locke might have said. So what we need, Bentham says, is not strict equality, but the maximum amount of practical equality. Right. So strict equality is in principle what my theory argues for, but but in the real world, the actual world in which we live, where we have to take into account things like um, human motivations, we want to achieve the most amount of equality that we can practically achieve. And then the question is, how much? Right? How much inequality do we need to allow for in order to provide the appropriate incentives? And I think actually in Bentham's case, he was prepared to allow for quite a, a large amount of equality. But that's a practical matter. That's a matter to for not for political philosophers, but for economists and others to determine. You have to look into how the world actually works. Again, you see the naturalism in Bentham's theory. You have to look into how the world actually works and allow the level of equality that's required in order to produce the maximum for everyone. And we'll see this idea picked up on in by John Rawls, uh, theorist that we're going to look at later.
Okay, so that's one of the implications of Bentham's theory, the implication to do with uh, redistribution. Now I want to talk about a problem with Bentham's theory. The problem is to do with comparisons. Um, comparisons within a person and comparisons between people. So um, at any one time, I can tell you that, so let's say, I'd rather eat an ice cream than read a book. So let's just say right now, I'd rather eat an ice cream than read a book. So I can tell you that I would get more pleasure now from eating an ice cream than I would from reading a book. But if you ask me how much more pleasure, I have no idea how to answer that question. I, I mean, I could say twice as much. I don't, I don't know. I have no idea. I, mean, I couldn't say twice as much. I couldn't, I, and I can't put numbers on it. But if Bentham's position is going to work, because remember, we're supposed to be able to use this for social planning, for, for social, um, uh, for you know, government planning. If we're going to be able to do this, we are going to have to put numbers on it. But how, how can we put numbers on it? I can't even put numbers on the fact that I'd rather eat, you know, I, I can't say, well, a nice, eating an ice cream would give me 6.25 units of pleasure and reading a book would only give me 4.61. It doesn't make any sense, right? So that's one problem. And another problem that it's even more is interpersonal comparison. We talked a little bit about this before. So how can I compare my pleasure of eating an ice cream with your pleasure of eating an ice cream? <clears throat> right? We can, because I can't put numbers on my own pleasure, how can I can, can even begin to compare my pleasures and your pleasures? And we're absolutely going to have to make these interpersonal comparisons if Bentham's system is going to work, because the whole idea is we're supposed to be trying to maximize utility in society in general, and that will require us to make tri trade-offs, right? Sometimes... Um, we're going to have to go. F uh, we have to kind of have to adopt policies that will bring some displeasure to some people, but bring more pleasure to people overall. But unless there's some way of making interpersonal comparisons, we're not going to be able to achieve this. And this is a very serious problem for Bentham, and I think it's generally accepted that Bentham can't solve this problem. And as a result, the neoclassical utilitarians, who we're going to study next, have a very different approach. Uh, to working out what social policy requires. Another problem with Bentham's theory is to do with justice, and the essential complaint here against Bentham is that his position, his utilitarianism, allows for, or in some case even requires, uh, people to commit what we would regard as serious acts of injustice. So just to take one kind of example of this, Let's just imagine that we were living in a society where there's a despised minority. Um, right, so there's a lot of dis... The majority feel a lot of displeasure at the existence of this despised minority. You might argue on utilitarian grounds, and if maximising happiness and maximising the amount of pleasure over pain in society is what we're after, you might imagine that in certain circumstances that might call for that despised minority to be oppressed by enslaving them or killing them or whatever. Okay, so it, in these kind of cases, it looks as if um, uh, utilitarianism, or the kind of utilitarianism that Bentham is advancing, will not only permit but require people to do things that we regard as heinously unjust. Just to take another example of this on a more personal level, I mean, people invent all these gruesome examples um, to test the theory. This is this so-called forced organ transplant example. Um, the, the idea is you get, um, there are five people in hospital at, and they need organ transplants. And, you know, you, one person needs a heart, or another person needs kidney, or another person needs a liver, or whatever, right? Um, um, and there's no available donors. Well, there is, however, a homeless person who just lives down, you know, who's just living in the uh, alleyway down the street, and, and you know, he's reasonably healthy, apart from being homeless. We could just take him into hospital and kill him and take out his vital organs and give it to these five people. Right, now you might argue on utilitarian grounds, that's what should happen, because one person dies, but you save five people, and maybe that's going to maximise utility. Um, and, but the, the argument is that that's not the just thing to do. That's an unjust thing to, to just use someone, sacrifice someone for the benefit of other people in this way is unjust.
but Bentham's theory seems to even encourage or even require this. Okay, so that's the justice objection to utilitarianism. The, the, the objection is that it requires you to behave in unjust ways. Now, there's a reply to this that utilitarians advance, and there's a reply to the reply that we need to think about. The reply that utilitarians often give to this kind of argument is to say, look, if you actually think about the real world, you'll realize that my theory doesn't actually require me to do this. So think about the, the forced organ transplant case. So on the face of it, yes, utilitarianism says, get this homeless person, kill him, rip out his vital organs and give it to these five people who need them. But if you think about the long-term consequences of acting in this way, you'll see that utilitarianism doesn't actually recommend this. Because imagine living in a society where, at a moment's notice, you could just, well, at a moment's no, no notice, you could just be hauled off the street and have your vital organs ripped out and dispersed to various people. It would be a pretty awful society in which to live. So a society that was actually like that would not be a happy place. So, the utilitarian says, my theory does not require me to perform these unjust acts, um, because if we did perform those unjust acts, then utility would be damaged in the long run. Okay, so that's the first kind of reply utilitarian can give, right? Um, you think that my theory is going to require me to do unjust things, it won't actually. Think about the long-term consequences, and you'll see that... Um, Utilitarianism does not recommend that people perform these unjust actions. Okay, so that's that's one kind of reply utilitarians can give. Now, one thing to want you to notice about this reply, it's very important, is the reply does not say that the reason you shouldn't, for example, take out people's vital organs without their consent, um, the reason that you shouldn't do that is not because it's unjust. The reason you shouldn't, it's not because the people have rights or anything like that. The reason that you shouldn't do it is because there are long-term consequences right, that will make people unhappy. Okay, and for my part, that's why I can't accept the reply. Because I think the reason that you shouldn't rip out people's vital organs is because it's wrong to do it. Not because it leads to bad consequences, but just because it's wrong to do it. So for me, the reply, while it softens the objection to utilitarianism, doesn't actually remove it. My intuitions tell me right, that the reason that you shouldn't conduct forced organ transplants is because it's wrong to the victim, and that's wrong to the victim regardless of the consequences. So that's part of what you have to work out. You have to work out where you stand on this. Does the reply satisfy you? Um, <clears throat> does the reply get at why you think, it, if you do, I hope you do, think it's wrong to conduct forced organ transplants and the like or, or, um, or uh, oppress despised minorities? So again, the, the, the utilitarian might say, well, on the face of it, in principle, maybe it looks as if my theory is saying, yes, oppressed the despised minority. But actually, think about the long-term consequences of doing that. If you look at the long-term consequences of oppressing people, you'll see that the society will be worse off in the long run. And what I want to say is that might be true. I'm not sure it is always true, actually, but it might be true. But even so, even if it were always true, it doesn't get at, um, it doesn't satisfy my intuitions because my intuitions are that the reason that it's wrong to, to oppress and a, pre, a, a despised minority is because it's wrong, not just because it leads to negative consequences. And we'll see theories that uh, would explain why it's wrong later. Okay, all right, there's another diff, totally different kind of reply that the utilitarian can give to the kind of objections we've been looking at, the just, justice-based objections. And that is just to say, yeah, sometimes my theory will require you to do things that you consider to be unjust. Too bad for your intuitions. Now, this theory is called outsmarting because it was, uh, well, I don't know if it's true to say it was invented by, but it was promoted by a guy called Smart, Jack Smart, who's an Australian utilitarian, and so it came to be known as outsmarting. And the, uh, the idea is just to say you just accept that your theory can have negative uh, consequences, uh, that is, 
there's a clash. You accept that there's a clash between the theory and our intuitions. You accept that and you just say, yeah, too bad for our intuitions. Like the utilitarian says, I've got a really good theory here, right? If it clashes with your intuitions, too bad for your intuitions. Your intuitions, after all, is just a kind of prejudice. Like we should stick with the theory and abandon the intuitions. Now, I think even Smart came to realize that that was a bit too quick because, after all, in the end, the only reason that we find utilitarianism appealing at all is because it latches on to an important intuition that we have that is the intuition that it's a good idea to make the world a better place to make people happy and so on and so we can't just give up our intuitions just like that and it may be that we can find and maybe we will find uh, during this course a theory that suit that fits our intuitions better a theory that fits our sense of justice better than the theory that utili of utilitarianism Okay, so that's the justice objection and the reply to the re objection and the reply to the reply and then the outsmarting reply. Okay, a different kind of objection is invented by was invented by Robert Nozick, a guy we've mentioned and a guy we'll study later, and it's the pleasure machine objection to utilitarianism. Now, this is a kind of philosopher's thought experiment. He kind of invents this of science fiction example and then uses it to test our intuitions about things. So just let me tell you the example and explain how it's supposed to work. So the example is we imagine that some mad scientist has invented a machine. Um, and what you can, what we can do with this machine is we can, you can, you can hook yourself up to it. So, you know, you sort of go into the machine and I don't know, you get electrodes attached to your head and in your arms and fingertips and on your legs and you get hooked up to the machine in some way, right? And then you turn the machine on, and what the machine then does is bombard your um, central nervous system with pleasure sensation, right? So it's just an intense, constant feeling of pleasure. Okay. Now, I guess, you know, everything else being equal, we'd all like to try that. I mean, that would be a kind of made, 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 amazing thing to feel. But Nozick says there's a catch with this particular machine. The catch is that once the machine's turned on and once you're hooked up, it can't be switched off and you can't be unhooked. So it's an all or nothing choice. You've got to choose to hook yourself up to the machine and switch it on or just to continue with your normal life. Okay, so once you're in the machine, that's it, right? That you'll have no, you'll have that pleasurable sensation for, for the rest of your life, but you'll have no other experience. You'll just be in the machine. And Nozick's question is, okay, so imagine that such a machine exists. Would you choose to hook yourself up to the machine? Right? Would you choose to hook yourself up to the machine knowing that that will be the rest of your life? The rest of your life, you'll, just, you'll be having intense pleasure sensations, but that will be it. You'll have no more experience. And, uh, and Nozick's answer to this is, answer to this is no and a lot of people answer this question no they say no I wouldn't agree to hook myself up to the machine now what does this show what I mean there, there isn't such a machine so what does it matter well what it shows is that if if you are not prepared to hook yourself up to the machine even as a kind of thought experiment what that seems to reveal is that you think something else in life is valuable other than pleasure Right, so the, the point of the thought experiment is not, oh, you know, oh, gee, someone might invent one of these machines one day and we better actually think about how it should be used. The point of the thought experiment is to, is to reveal to you what you already believe, even though you might not know you already believe it. Right, and it's a, that's a curious thing that human beings are like this. We can believe things without knowing that we believe them. And sometimes these kind of science fiction-y thought experiments can reveal to us what we believe but don't know we believe. And Nozick thinks the thought experiment does this, at least for many, well, I, in my experience, the vast majority of people will say, no, I don't want to be hooked up to this pleasure machine. And what that reveals to them, says Nozick, is that they value, you value, something other than pleasure in life. And then you might think about, well, what is it? What, 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 what might that be? Now, we, we can talk about the, what it could be. I mean, it could be that you actually care about living a life rather than just having pleasure sensations. That's what ben, uh, Nozick thinks. Indeed, that's what I think. 
Um, but the key thing to see is whatever it is, whatever it is that you think you would lose by going into the pleasure machine is something that Bentham ignores. He says, right, that the only thing that matters in life is happiness, where happiness means pleasure. And what we've discovered, if the pleasure machine argument works, what we've discovered is that that's wrong. Right? That the fact is that we value things other than pleasure because we would not be prepared to sacrifice them and go into the pleasure machine. Okay, now I think that's, there might be replies to it, but I think that's a very powerful argument. And it's worth thinking about, um, about it not only as a philosophical argument, but as a reflection of the political world in which we live. Uh, because I think there's reason to think that, or, or to worry about the fact that the world in which we live seems to be constructed as a kind of pleasure machine uh, in order to obtain our, well, I was going to say consent, but that's not the quite, quite the right word, acquiescence to what's happening uh, around us. And one of the great uh, images for capturing this occurs at the end of um, George Orwell's 1984 where the, the hero in that story, who's tried to fight against the system but has failed, ends up becoming kind of happy with it. Right? So he's, he's in this terribly oppressive society, and he's tried to fight against it, um, and he's failed. And in the end, he kind of becomes contented with the society, happy with it. And that's the moment in which you realize, that's the moment of maximum tragedy. Right? The moment of maximum tragedy is not when he's upset about stuff. The moment of maximum tragedy is when he's happy with the way things are. Right? And, uh, and one might also in this context think about Bentham's own, Jeremy Bentham's own uh, invention of the panopticon, which is his sort of image of what an ideal prison would look like. And I have a picture, there's a sort of a model of this that was built in... Uh, in Statesville in Illinois. It's not quite right, the model, but anyway, it's worth having a look. So here, here it is on the slide. Okay, so, so this is a prison, and you can see there's a kind of t a watchtower in the middle, and then around the outside are the cells. So th and this is a, it, the, the building is a circle. Um, now, the, the control tower is not quite right, because you can see, I, th I think a, that's a person in there. Maybe it's a dummy. Um, but uh, anyway, a person is supposed to be able to be in the control tower, but we're not supposed to be able to see that person. Now, the idea, this is Bentham's design. The idea is the person in the control tower can see into all the cells, but the, but the people in the cells, the prisoners, cannot see the person in the control tower. That's how it's supposed to work, right? So the people, the person in the control tower can any one time see the peop anyone in the cells, right? But the people in the cells can never tell whether the person in the control tower is looking at them. So what that means is if you're in a cell, right, you know at any moment you could be being looked at, but you never know when you're being looked at. Okay. All right, so you get the idea, right? So you, you're constantly aware of the possibility that you're being watched. You never know when you're being watched. You assume you're being watched sometimes, but you don't know when. And the idea is that this will cause you to adjust your behavior, but you will start conforming to the whatever the relevant social norms are, because you know that at any particular moment you may be being watched. Now, I think this idea of the panopticons is, well, I'm not the only one, I mean... <laughs> Foucault made a huge deal of this, I think rightly, because I think it's a wonderful image of what modern society is starting to look like. Um, we live in a world in which there's a huge amount of secrecy in government, for example, and let's just talk specifically about government, as the sort of WikiLeaks saga revealed. I mean, whatever one stands on, however one stands on the propriety of what the WikiLeaks people were doing, the fact is, that WikiLeaks revealed the enormous secrecy that goes on in the conduct of modern government, even in democratic societies. I mean, we know very little about what happens. 
And of course, we're living in increasingly surveilled societies. Um, and now with the coronavirus, this has just exploded. Uh, and so there is a sense in which we are always being watched, or at least we're, there's always the potential that we're being watched. So just an, an example that's um, relevant to me at the moment is I, we, we have a rescue dog uh, living in the house at the moment. He's not going to stay. As it happens, he hasn't really worked out. But um, he, uh, he, we have a lot of trouble with him barking. When dogs walk past the house, he goes just completely apeshit. He just goes mad. And uh, and we're struggling to know what to do. Well, we haven't found a way of dealing with it, which is not the biggest problem with him. But anyway, um, that's one of the problems we've had with him. Um, and now, I so my wife and I have talked about what we might do about his barking, but I haven't done any searches for, I haven't looked up on the internet for nothing. Nevertheless, on my iPad, whenever I look at news or anything, I keep getting ads about what to do about barking dogs. Now, I suppose this could just be coincidence, but I don't believe that it is. I believe that my devices are listening to me, right? and as a result, I'm getting these ads. Um, I don't know which devices it is. I don't know quite what's going on, but I'm sure I'm being surveilled in some way, and as a result, I'm getting these ads. Now, in this particular case, that's not the end of the world, um, uh, because you know, it's just some ads and I, who cares? I don't click on them. It's no, no big deal. But uh, but this, I'd be naive to think that this was the only example of it happening. I mean, it's happening in general. And um, this can have a, a very subtle and unconscious impact on my behavior. This is a little bit of an uh, uncomfortable example. But uh, I think it's a very useful, it's a very useful one to actually bring out the point that I'm trying to make. So, so I sleep with my phone next to my bed. And if I think, as perhaps I now do think, that my phone is listening to me, that will have an impact on my behavior. I might start to be careful about what I say to my wife and so on. Um, uh, and just think about that. Just think about how this might, you know, even if it, the, the thought that it's that these devices are listening to you is just at the back of your mind, it's not, you know, in the front of your consciousness, how that might affect how you talk to people and what you say. Um, because, you know, you're always worried that someone might be listening. Um, and, you know, I think this is a very serious question because we do live in a society that's like this now. I mean, certainly when you're, when you're in private, it looks like lots of the devices that we have listen to us in various ways or could be listening to us in various ways and when we're out in public we're very often watched through cctv and the like um and you know we're tracked you know our devices track us and so on um, so we do live in a world of surveillance and it's worth having a think about how this might affect our behavior in ways that we're not necessarily aware of now, the idea is that this is all supposed to be done for the common good. And here you can see Bentham's influence very clearly. It's all done for the common good in the sense that um, having this surveillance promotes or discourages us from acting in what we would call antisocial ways. So act, it discourages us from acting in ways that negatively impact on our happiness, on utility. But what if we've given up in order to achieve this? Um, it looks like we've made, or at least one could argue, that we've made a very significant sacrifice of our freedom in order to be happy. And then just in that context, just think about our devices. You know, people are very excited about getting the latest iPhone or the latest uh, Android device or whatever it is. Um, but if the consequence of that is it's listening to you, right, maybe this is a happiness that it would be better not to have. And just note that that idea doesn't really compute for Bentham, right? Happiness is the only good for him, but maybe there are some happinesses that are, it's better not to have. Now, a last problem that I'm going to talk, there are lots of problems with, the, you know, that, that doesn't mean that the, lots of problems with utilitarianism, and that doesn't mean that there aren't replies that utilitarians could give. It doesn't mean those replies wouldn't work, um, but there are lots of problems, but I'm only going to discuss one more, and that is specifically with Bentham's theory, the, connect, the, the tension between psychological hedonism and government. 
But recall what psychological hedonism is. Psychological hedonism is Bentham's belief that every human being is motivated by one thing only, the pursuit of pleasure. Right, the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain. But that's just the same thing. There's two sides of the same coin. That's one motivation. Right, their own personal happiness. And remember that we asked when we were discussing this, well, what's the point then of providing this, this theory of justice, this moral theory? What's the point of utilitarianism? If we're all just going to do what we see as leading to our own happiness, what's the point in telling us what we should do? And remember that the reply was the role of government is to construct laws and other things, but importantly laws, that align our happiness with the happiness of everybody in society. Okay, so the point of the law, Bentham thinks, is to, is to get us to see that, uh, to construct the society in such a way that we see that if I pursue my happiness, right, the things that will bring me happiness will bring everybody else happiness. Okay, now, um, the problem with this argument is that it seems to ignore the rather obvious fact that government consists of people too. And I think this is a very genuine blindness that Bentham had. He did, just didn't see that if his theory is the psychological hedonism, the theory that every individual is motivated to pursue their own pleasure, and that's it. If, if that's right, then that applies to everybody in government too. And I just think Bentham just didn't get that. Right? So Bentham's idea is that government is going to create a set of laws and so on that align individual happiness with the happiness of the of the society that produce the common good. But why would they? Why would that happen? Why wouldn't people in government just produce laws that conduce to their own happiness rather than the happiness of everybody? And as I say, I just I don't have an answer to this. I just think Bentham just didn't get it. Um, uh, Bentham's original position, and this is this is news, I think, to even a lot of people who who generally like Bentham, to generally support Bentham. Bentham generally thought that government should consist of the British aristocracy. He was not a fan of democracy. Um, he was a fan of the, the rule in Britain by the aristocracy because he trusted the British aristocracy to implement his utilitarian reforms. So the idea is, you know, once he'd had a chance to educate them, of course, on what they ought to be done, you could trust the British aristocracy to do the right thing. Um, but that didn't happen. The British aristocracy, surprise, surprise, I mean, who surprised? But, well, Bentham was surprised. The British aristocracy weren't all that inclined to follow Bentham's reforms. And so he became disillusioned with them and eventually uh, argued for electoral reform, increasing the franchise size of the franchise, so democratic reforms. Um, uh, but not because he thought that democracy was a, a requirement of justice in itself. He just thought that if more people would vote, then it would be more likely that they would favour policies that would maximise utility in the long run. OK, so I just think it's utterly remarkable that Bentham could ever have thought that the British aristocracy or you know, any group could, be, um, uh, could escape the consequences of his own theory. Right? I just that seems to me to be very odd, a, a real blindness that uh, Bentham had. So he, he came to realise that the British aristocracy were as captured by his by psychological hedonism, or at least, let's just forget about Bentham for a moment, are captured by their own worldview, as anybody else was. And the question that we have to ask, in terms of Bentham's wider theory, is why I think that the experts of today will, and this is a very pertinent question to ask during this current crisis, why well, think that the experts of today will be any better at escaping their own worldview than uh, the aristocracy in Bentham's day were? So with respect to medical experts, for example, that are playing a very important role in governing our societies right, right at the moment, right as I record this, um, you can expect, of course, a medical expert to, be, to see the world through the lens of medicine, and they, they see the world in terms of, People kept, numbers of people catching the virus, the spread of the virus, the number of deaths, the um, hospitals, uh, and so and so on and so on. But, but it's quite rare to find a medical expert who understands that if we shut down our society in such a way that creates a depression, 
right, then a whole lot of people are going to suffer that way and suffer very seriously, including dying as a result of unemployment and poverty and so on. So we're all captured by our worldviews, and there doesn't seem to be any reason to think that the experts of today are, are immune, any more immune from this than the aristocracy in Bentham's day were. And another example of this that I think is particularly pertinent in this context is I think this, so I think Bentham had this unjustified faith in government. You know, somehow people in government, Bentham thought, were able to escape his own psychological theory, but somehow they could rise above their own selfish interests and work for the common good. Uh, this was, I just think, a blindness that Bentham had. I think it's very common that lawyers have the same blindness, but the bl particularly when I say lawyers, I'm particularly talking about academic lawyers and law students of law, law students in particular, have this blindness not with respect to the government, but with respect to judges. Right? They somehow think that judges are capable of rising above their own worldview and of just seeing the moral truth. It's a very serious problem, I think, with how... People, we, we teach law and with how people study it. Anyway, that's something to think about and keep in mind. But that's enough for this episode. In the next episode, we're going to go on to talk about neoclassical utilitarianism.